Romans 5.10 speaks of reconciliation. It makes a comparison. For when, for if, when we were enemies, that's the first part of the comparison, we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, so uh, much more being reconciled, that's the other side of the comparison, we should be saved by His life. So when we were enemies, we were reconciled by His death. Well, He only died once, so He's not going to die more. So now he, he lives forevermore. And now because of His death, we're reconciled, so how much more can he do that he's alive and we're reconciled? And so I've often got this mental uh, picture in my mind of the, the cross of Jesus. And on this side, our enemies, we were enemies and he died. And on this side is now we're friends and he's alive. It's quite a transition from one side of the cross to the other. There's reconciliation. Other words that come to mind are peace. You have peace with who you're reconciled to, or fellowship. Uh, reconciliation really doesn't mean much if, if there's no inter exchange between the, one, the, between the parties that are reconciled. Acceptance is another way of saying reconciled. When you, when you come, you're welcomed. Or you're received, like Esther was in the presence of the king when he she came. She didn't she didn't have assurance. She came just in case there was a chance, and she she was received. <clears throat> the contrast this the need what, the need for reconciliation. It's always good to to look at both sides. The need for reconciliation is that we there was enmity between us and God, and without seeing the need for reconciliation then the reconciliation itself won't mean very much. Yeah. There's en there is enmity between us and God. The root word, of course, in enmity is enemy. Yeah. There was a controversy. Remember the Lord said in the prophets, I have a controversy. He was speaking to a particular generation, but it, it, what, it wasn't limited to that. The Lord could have said that to the whole human race. I have a controversy. Yeah. Offense, the need for reconciliation between God and man is because there, there is an offense. God is the one that owns the offense. We were the one that caused the offense. So there's a need for a reconciliation or strife. Remember the Lord said uh, in Noah's day, my spirit will not always strive with men. So there's a time of mercy is what he's saying. That, that I will strive, but just consider, just read between the lines there, is that the Spirit of God is striving with men because there's a difference. There's some chafing between God and man. There's a need for reconciliation. And, and there's a, there's a, uh, mercy uh, is the proposition of, of open door. Is striving is 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 a, an offering of an open door. God's Spirit strives with us. And if you do some inventory and look back at your own conversion, you'll have to admit that God did some striving with you. And since then, I would venture, because I'm a man of like passions, I would venture to say that He strove with you again. Since then. You see, there's a need for reconciliation. Amen. In Matthew chapter 5, a couple examples of this. Matthew 5, Jesus speaking about going, taking your offering to the, to the temple and offering it to God. He said, if you remember on the way that your brother has something against you, go be reconciled. Then go offer. You see, that need for reconciliation is where there was an offense. There was some, there was some issue, no matter what it was. Um, go be reconciled to your brother. Come together again and bring in... Uh, re remove the offense. That's what reconciliation is. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, speaking about a husband or a, a woman uh, leaving, leaving her husband, uh, she said, let it, Paul said, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled. Go back. Be reunited. That's what reconciliation is, being reunited. 
<clears throat> now, like I said, this, this word of reconciliation, it really, it, it really becomes precious when you see that God was against you. And that, that's kind of, a, that's kind of the, uh, the kernel of conviction, is when you see that uh, things between you and God aren't on good terms. That's, that's, what, that's what conviction is. When you see it, God's always seen it. And when we see it, that's what we call conviction. David, in Psalm 7, 11, he said, God is angry with the wicked every day, and that's not embellished. He's angry with the wicked every day. That means he was angry with me, and he was angry with you. And when that comes home, see, it doesn't go well with people with whom God's angry. He's given us examples, abundant examples, examples of the whole entire world, examples of whole, uh, a whole generation, examples of whole cities of whom God was angry with, and it didn't turn out well. You see, you think of the, the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom. God's angry with the wicked every day. And when you realize that God's... See, Brother Ricky talked about the love of God this morning, how it's been devalued. It's like it's been robbed and pillaged. And that is partly because God, people don't know that God can be angry. And when you know God's angry, now the love of God means something. Amen. Psalm 38.1 says, Rebuke me not in thy wrath. And David prayed that. This is not the prayer of Alexander the coppersmith. This is David's. Rebuke me not in thy wrath. David didn't presume, well, I'm... I'm the king of Israel, so I know he's not going to... Didn't think like that. Neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. That's one of those phrases that, as Brother Dean would say, it's good to just bring that up every once in a while. Hot displeasure. And because we have believed the gospel today, and because we have faith today, doesn't mean that you are forever exempt from his hot displeasure. You see how this, this makes reconciliation, the, the, uh, the, op, the opportunity for reconciliation makes it very precious. Uh -huh. To be accepted by God, whom he, he has hot displeasure. Uh -huh. And Jesus hasn't made God incapable of being displeased. That's right. Reconciliation is not just merely a judicial status change, like a like, like a visa issued by a sovereign government. I've had to apply for visas to be, to be accepted into different countries. That visa stamped in my passport didn't change my character. It was just a judicial act that let me enter the country at a certain time. This is not what reconciliation is. It's not just, it's not just a stamp on, on a passport, so to speak. It's not, it's not just a legal transaction. There are some legalities in it, but it's not merely illegal. It's experiential. It's, somebody mentioned tonight, the cleansing of the conscience. That's one work of reconciliation. Is when you know, it's, see, it's one thing to be forgiven of your sins. It's another thing to know it. That's the cleansing of the conscience. To know that my sins are taken away. That's me experiencing reconciliation. Yeah. To know that the, the God who, who said all have sinned is the same God that said, I have taken your sin away. It's the same one. He's taken my sin away. It's, to, it's experiential in that I am born again. So I am not who I used to be. Yeah. Adam is not being reconciled. New creatures. Yeah. New creatures are the ones that are accepted. My life, my life is hid with Christ in God. That's the experience of reconciliation. In that God, it, God accepts me. It's not, just, it's not just that God can't accept men. It's that God accepts me as I, because I'm hid in Christ. The experience of reconciliation. Here's some examples. Reconciled people pray Things like this. And just, just compare this prayer to when you, when you first sense that God was displeased, that his hot displeasure. Just, just think about this. Search me, O God, and try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. Would you have prayed that? Would you have prayed that before when you knew you were guilty and defiled and condemned and God was angry with you? 
reconciled people, they pray, search me, O God, because of this assurance that they're accepted. Reconciled people actually look forward to giving an account of themselves to God because they've been reconciled to the judge. They've been accepted. They have, they have uh, fellowship with the judge. They're received by him. And so why? You have every reason to look forward to anticipate this, giving an account of yourself because you're reconciled to him. Reconciliation is not just a technicality. Reconciliation, this table rep is, um, is the price that was paid for reconciliation. That's how big the work is. That's how, big, that's, how, that's how difficult it was for the righteous to be saved, is that Jesus had to give his life, to offer his body, and to uh, give his blood. So reconciled people are reconciled in the beloved. Our reconciliation, to the degree that you are in Christ, you're reconciled. Mm -hmm. To the degree that you have laid hold of Christ, you've laid hold of reconciliation. That's one of the peculiar things about, um, and that, that, that means unique. Peculiar doesn't just mean odd or weird. Uh, peculiar things about, recon about the redemptive economy is that it's all invested in a man. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a document. It's, a, it's in a man. We're reconciled in a man. That's why we come to this table to remember a man. We come to God in a man. We're being represented to God by a man. Our life is hid in a man in God. And we're reconciled to God in this man, Christ Jesus. That's why we're accepted. We're accepted because of Him. In Him, when God sees Christ, we're accepted only in Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for these uh, words that you've given uh, of reconciliation. And we pray that as we come to this table and eat this bread and drink this cup, that our minds would be productive in remembering Jesus and comprehending uh, the gift that he has given us of himself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.